introduction and uh, well I'm really happy to be here and uh, looking forward to an exciting workshop. So what I'm going to do is uh, just to give a very short introduction uh, or an overview of my book. This, this is the title that was assigned to me. <laughs> I've looked up in the it's a summary. <laughs> we don't have to put it in Dutch, but like so that's what I'm going to do. And um, so yeah, my book is actually uh, well, the combination of the end point, I mean, for me, personally, there was a combination of um, many years, almost 20 years, actually, of work on scientific understanding. Uh, and uh, one, of our, uh, one of my earlier uh, publications was this other book, which uh, appeared uh, 10 years ago, an edited volume, uh, which was uh, contained chapters and, and papers on understanding. And it was edited by me and my PhD students, uh, Kai Eichner and Sabina Leonelli. And Sabina is here as well, also on the program. And so she was also involved, and I'm, I'm really grateful for her contributions, in this whole project on understanding. But um, my own work uh, is then um, summarized or uh, contained in, in the book. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so my, whole, my interest in understanding um, started when I realized that philosophers of science weren't really, uh, hadn't paid much attention to it uh, for a long time. They were mainly interested in explanation. And why was that? Well, that was because, and here I quote Carl Hempel, um, understanding did not belong to the vocabulary of logic, but to the psychological and pragmatic aspects of explanation. So, of course, all of you know that Hempel did a lot of important work <coughs> on explanation in his a book, Aspects of Scientific Explanation. He mentioned understanding, he said, well, it's the pragmatic dimension, it's not, not really of interest to, interest to us philosophers who want to do a logical analysis of scientific explanation. So, for Hempel, what was important was that explanation should be analyzed as an objective relation between uh, theories and phenomena. And, and for instance, his own leader phenomenological model was an example of that. And whether or not someone, a subject or a scientist, understands yeah, this relation is a psychological affair. It's, it's, it's a subjective, pragmatic affair. Some people maybe do understand, some people don't. But that's independent of the objective relation. And that's what they thought we should focus, about, uh, focus on. So, I'm focused, so this is about understanding why. It's about the understanding that is provided by explanations. And of course, there may be many more kinds of understanding. And in the next talk, uh, Christoph will talk uh, about dimensions of understanding. And I, that's the only thing about, uh, about this talk that I know. Uh, I don't know the contents, but maybe he will talk a bit more about different kinds of understanding than understanding why. We'll see. But I'm focusing on understanding why. And uh, I think that this traditional picture is misguided, it's wrong, because as, well, uh, most of us will know, and hopefully many of us will agree, today we know, uh, by analyzing scientific practice in more detail, much more than the empiricists did, that models are central to explanation, that there's a central role for models in science, and also in scientific explanation. Scientific explanation is typically model-based, and what does that mean? That means that you construct models, if you want to explain phenomena, you construct models that represent the phenomenon in such a way that a theory can be applied to it. And to construct models, to build models, you, uh, well, you have to, uh, there's, no, there's no strict rules for it, you have to be creative, it's an art. Uh, so instead of just uh, letting an algorithm run on, uh, you have to make decisions about which idealizations to make, which approximations to make. In a word, a scientist who wants to build models needs skills. And that's the central idea of my theory of understanding. Now here we have some important philosophers of science, some of, which, some of whom were and still are at LSE. Yeah, that's where this work was done. Um, so that's a source of inspiration for me. Now, models are important. And Sabina, in her talk, will talk about models, specifically about model organisms. And I'm Looking forward to that because model organisms are, of course, not built, or maybe they are, I don't know. And do you need skills for that? And, uh, which skills? Well, she will talk about that, I hope. So, 
that's later this afternoon. Okay, so my thesis is that skills are uh, central and very important, and um, I have um, translated this or paraphrased this in the following idea that is uh, related to the notion of intelligibility. My claim, my thesis is that mm -hmm. to explain a phenomenon, you have you need an intelligible theory. Uh, why is that? Because it is because if you want to explain a phenomenon on the basis of a particular the uh, theory T, uh, you build a model, uh, a model that mediates between the theory and the phenomena, and as I just told you, uh, you need skills to, uh, you need the right skills to build that, that model. And in other words, uh, this means that, uh, or this implies, that the theory T should be intelligible to you, to the scientist who builds the model where intelligibility is defined as the value that scientists attribute to the cluster of qualities of T that facilitate its use. <coughs> so the intelligibility of theories is a crucial condition for understanding the phenomenon. And what is intelligibility? Well, I just defined it. What are its features? It's not an intrinsic property of theories. You cannot say this theory is intrinsically unintelligible. No, it's a context-dependent value. It's, it's it's the value, it's the aggregate value of all the qualities, the properties of the theories that um, are uh, facilitating its use. Yeah? So there's a, there has to be a match between the properties of the theories and the skills of the scientists. And well, what kind of properties are these? Well, here are just some examples. Visualizability, simplicity, continuity, maybe some causal properties. You can think of many more. Um, so I'm focusing on skills, uh, well, and skills, abilities. Hazok will have a talk about abilities and knowledge. So my claim is that um, skills are essential for understanding. So that in that way, understanding is different from knowledge. But maybe Hazok will tell us, will argue that knowledge is also also requires skills. And I'm very curious to hear this. Uh, but, well, we have to wait for a while and see what he has to say about that. <coughs> okay, so intelligibility and skills and understanding. These are the basic notions of my approach, of my account of scientific understanding. And they are summarized in these criteria here. Uh, first, the criteria for understanding phenomena, which says that the phenomenon is understood scientifically by a scientist if and only if she possesses an explanation of P based on intelligible theory and also conforms to the basic understanding values of empirical adequacy and internal consistency. And this is an addition because, of course, only intelligibility is insufficient. I mean, you can think of intelligible theories like intelligent design, perhaps, or astrology. They may be intelligible to people, but they still have to build a model uh, that is a satisfactory explanation and gives a satisfactory account of the phenomenon. And that means uh, that it, this model, <coughs> this model-based explanation, has to be apparently adequate and consistent. Uh, I think these are also values, but they are very important values, basic values. Now, intelligibility is in, in, the, uh, is in this definition. Uh, and intelligibility, as I already explained, is a contextual value. It's not an intrinsic property of theories. And uh, it, so it depends on the context of the scientist, on his or her skills. Now you can say, how can you how can you ever know that that theory is intelligible for the scientist? Isn't that just a subjective matter, uh, just an opinion or a value that someone may express? Well, maybe it is, but it's also possible. Well, it isn't. Uh, it's not. <laughs> Let's say it's not. Because you can test it, I mean, you can still have, it's subjective because it's, it's the subject's value, eh? but you can still test whether or not uh, he or she is right in calling the theory intelligible. For instance, by means of the test that I have given you here, eh? a scientific theory is intelligible for scientists in a particular context if they can recognize qualitatively characteristic consequence theory without performing exact calculations. And that means that you have, uh, that these scientists have a kind of developed a kind of intuitive insight into the workings of the theory. They can, you know, use it in a qualitative way, and they know how uh, what its implications are. 
And this is just one test. It's not a necessary condition because it also only applies to uh, mathematical fields, for instance, yeah, where you have to, where you can also make calculations. But it's just shown here to test that intelligibility is not purely subjective. Okay, um, to give you just a very short example, uh, my book, uh, the second half of my book is three long chapters, historical chapters with historical case studies. Uh, this is just a summary of a very small part of it. Uh, if you look in, at the 19th century, then we know and uh, we see the kinetic theory of gases in the second half of the 19th century as an important theory that was designed, developed to explain and understand uh, the phenomena and the behavior of gases. And the kinetic theory, theory as you all know, uh, proceeds or is based on the idea that a gas, gas is a collection of molecules in motion, like in that container over there. And this picture already, and it's a visual picture, also causal properties involved, uh, gives you already a qualitative understanding of the behavior of gases. And you can talk about it in a qualitative way, what happens when they hit the walls of the container, when they collide, and so on. And this intelligibility for the, the for the physicists involved, like Ludwig Boltzmann, was the basis of their work on the theory. And they further developed it by constructing models to explain more specific and detailed uh, phenomena of the behavior of gases, such as, for instance, this mo molecule. I've analyzed that in detail in chapter six of my uh, book, and that's the so-called dumbbell model for diatomic gases, which is, of course, a model because gases don't look like that. They, they already knew that in the 19th century, but it can be used to uh, explain and understand behavior of those classes. All right, now one final um, remark, if I may, about, well, this, yeah, how many minutes do I still have? Oh, you're fine. I'm fine, yeah, we started late, so I'm, I'm used to looking at the clock, and now I'm already confused because we didn't start at two, <laughs> so just three less. <laughs> okay. So this is just one case study, and I want to mention that uh, many more cases, I, I have <coughs> studies in the history of physics, but and my book is about scientific understanding. I'm not sure what the scope of this uh, approach to scientific understanding can be. I hope the physical, I'm sure the physical sciences, maybe the natural sciences in general, uh, more case studies will have to be done. Uh, Phyllis will be presenting a case study, I think, later in astrophysics. I'm looking forward to that, of course. Um, we'll see. Uh, and finally, I want to mention one aspect of my um, account my approach to understanding, and that is, is its non-factivist nature. So, understanding is not factive in the way knowledge is. Knowledge is factive. You can only know something is it, if it's true. Right? If it's, something isn't true, then you cannot know it, right? But what about understanding? Well, my claim is at least that understanding does not require the truth of the theories that you use, and the models as well. They don't have to be realistic or as realistic as possible. So the theory should be intelligible in my sense of the world, but it doesn't necessarily have to be true. Uh, and also, if we have these model-based explanations, uh, they, have the, they should be empirically adequate, of course, but that means that only that they have to be true of the observable aspects of the phenomena, uh, like this Dunbar model. It doesn't have to be the most realistic or the most accurate description of reality in, by itself. Uh, and this implies, and I think that's a good thing, if you want to have a model that is, um, well, that works, and that applies to scientific practice, that in different contexts, you can have different, radically different, incompatible theories or models uh, of the phenomena for understanding. So, um, well, Mauricio will talk about the representation and understanding. Um, I'm not sure what he's going to say, but... My view would be that representation in the sense of accurate description of reality is not a necessary requirement for understanding. Okay, that's, uh, that's about it. So my last, my conclusion is, uh, well, a, a very brief, uh, two slogan, uh, uh, summary of my view in two slogans. So scientific understanding of phenomena requires intelligible theories and intelligibility is contextual. In different contexts, scientists value different theoretical qualities as tools for understanding. Thank you.